start the webinar now. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this month's appointment of the DSSC Insight Series, the monthly webinar appointment from the Data Spaces Support Center. Today, we are very excited to unveil one of the key milestones from the Data Space Support Center project, which is the Data Space Blueprint version 1.0. We will, we will do so with the following agenda. We will have a welcome by Professor Boris Sotto, the project coordinator from the Data Space Support Center. And from, then we will uh, with uh, Ber Verdong, Chief Executive Officer at the Luxembourg National Data Service, we will introduce the assets, the glossary, and the conceptual models. Following that, we will have a deep dive into the Blueprint version 1.0 by Matthias Punter and Claire Stolweg, our colleagues from TNO. And then we will have a dedicated Q&A session. As a reminder, you will have the chance to ask questions during the webinar using the chat box and also at the very end of the webinar. We will do at the, our very best to address the question in the chat as they come. And any unanswered question will be dealt, dealt with at the very end. So before I leave the floor to Boris, a few housekeeping items on my end. This webinar is recorded. So um, you will the, the recorded will be um, uploaded on our YouTube channel, which is available if you click on if you scan the QR code on this slide. On the same YouTube channel, you will find all, all the previous Insight series recording as well as uh, soon to be released uh, videos from a data space symposium annual event, which just took place in Darmstadt. And last, uh, for as, as a last point, in order to, uh, to stay up to date with the data space support center, you can subscribe to the newsletter. By doing that, you will learn, you will always stay up to date with our new latest releases, the news about our events and all the news from our community. Now, without, without further ado, uh, let me uh, let me introduce uh, our first speaker, Boris. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, yes, and I think it's um, as you mentioned, it's a great well milestone that we have achieved in March, um, which was also presented in the um, Data Space Symposium because um, we um, published the Blueprint version 1.0. And I'm more than happy to have my colleagues here, Claire, Matthias, and Bert, to um, go into the details of the um, blueprint, well, content, so to say, and what that actually means to you. Um, but before I hand over to them, I would like to take the opportunity to put it a little bit into context. And if you could please go one slide ahead. Um, right, so, exactly. So, um, in order to basically outline a little bit what the blueprint actually entails, um, it's important for you to know that um, everything, so to say, um, follows a, a consistent overall approach. Um, first of all, it's important to, um, uh, to, uh, to say that uh, the conceptual model is basically um, the, the information model of uh, a data space. Um, which is then also elaborated in the different assets that we produce as a DSSC. And sometimes I'm asked, oh, why do you come up with a conceptual model? Is it really needed? It's just, you know, a view graph. Well, in the end, if I would um, put myself into a position of a data space architect, for example, I would be probably asked at some point in time to come up with some sort of business design for, for what I do. So how should my data space look like? Well, and I could use the conceptual model as a, well, as a starting point uh, to basically, um, well, define which kind of entities um, entails, uh, are entailed in my, my data space and how the relationships among them are. Um, very closely related to the conceptual model is the glossary because the glossary um, explains in verbal descriptions and textual descriptions, could also say in definitions, um, what this conceptual model is all about. So what the actual concept means. So while let's say the conceptual model at the name says is somewhat which basically you could connect to a certain uh, phase in the software engineering process, um, the glossary rather is something which is digestible also for people who are not so much concerned with, let's say, modeling information systems, but rather want to know what um, the different terms that we use actually mean. 
Also, in order not to go into the details, but I should say also here that um, you may know that in many cases it's not so well so easy to come up with a single definition. But depending on the viewpoint that you have, there might be different notions of certain terms. Uh, in particular, if we, for example, distinguish a technical, so an architectural viewpoint from a viewpoint from, from a lawyer, for example, or somebody who is concerned with legislative issues. And um, I think um, a good, uh, let's say, example for why a glossary is needed is, let's say, the notion of a data intermediary, which can be totally differently understood <laughs> in overlapping communities, and that's why it's needed. Yes, in order to um, get started and not to be overwhelmed too much with the nitty gritty details, we have the starter kit, so a very high level cook recipe, so to say, which brings you up to speed. Um, so if you are concerned, let's say, well, oh, I just got, let's say, the mandate to build a data space and I don't know what my colleagues and other people are talking about, then probably the starter kit is the way to go. Um, However, also, once you progress in your endeavor to build a data space, and once you basically have also uh, developed and created your business design, so this is how my data space should look like, you will come to a point where you ask yourself the question, okay, what kind of specifications should I follow? Because remember, in the end, it's um, the ambition of the European uh, Union overall, not only the Commission, but the, but the European Union to create data spaces which are interoperable. And this can be achieved if we follow the same set of standards, because, well, that's basically the nature of standards, to ease inter interaction between different actors and um, uh, make life in the end interoperable. And therefore, we produced at this point of time a collection of standards, which is probably um, at this point of time to a certain extent of union, a union of everything which is out there, which we stepped over in order not to forget anything. Um, however, I think um, in order not to anticipate too much, but in the next stages, we will come up to, let's say, um, a closer look into what actually works together um, in order to make sure, let's say, that um, we, um, we can achieve or accomplish the mission that we are all in uh, to create uh, common and in particular interoperable data spaces. I should perhaps say at this uh, a point that um, among many different things supporting the uh, initial uh, initial the individual data space initiatives one of the um, data space support center uh, mandates is also to function as an operational arm of the european data innovation board and i say that because the european data innovation board has mainly two objectives the first one is the implementation of the well, the legal framework, in particular, the Data Governance Act and the Data Act um, across the European Union, in particular in the member states. And the second mandate and the second task is to make sure that the common European data spaces are implemented in an interoperable fashion. So therefore, it is very, very important to follow a consistent set of specs and standards. Yes, and in the end, the blueprint um, is on the one hand side, of course, the well, the framework of mainly all of this, but materializes uh, very heavily in the so-called building blocks, which will be um, presented later on. You can access all of this in a very nice, um, nicely formatted way if you go to our website, uh, dssc.eu, and um, surf through uh, to, to, to DSC offers which will then basically span across different websites, which explain what I just said. Um, right, um, if, you could, if we could go to the next slide, please. Right, the conceptual model, as mentioned, um, is depicted here on its highest level. So we have, let's say, a data space governance framework in the center, because I don't want to go to all the details. Please um, uh, allow me um, to at least stress a couple of points. Um, Remember, data spaces are a, a federated and to a certain extent, a collaborative or collective endeavor uh, to provide uh, mm -hmm. data sharing facilities, which we always looked at from a technical perspective. So we want to go without a central data store, of course, but at least um, equally important is the fact that we do not put, let's say, 
the authority for governance in, let's say, a hand in the hand of one single actor. And therefore, a data space governance framework basically re re reflects on, a, on an organizational governance level um, the ambition that we have on a technical level to have, let's say, a rather collective collaborative endeavor. Usually, we also see, let's say, the existence of data space governance authorities, which basically not only develop this governance framework, but also oversee that everybody behaves to the rules. And um, in the majority of cases that we see when it comes to data spaces is that this governance authority is also in pretty much all cases a collective endeavor. Of course, in the center, we have the data space itself. So which is the core object of what we do. So it's our central design artifact because in the end we want to create data spaces, of course. And of course we have a number of other concepts which are related to that, but I, uh, for the sake of time and not to consume too much time of Bertler and, and, and Matthias, I would uh, go to probably the next page, please. Right, um, glossary is something that I already mentioned. Um, when we talk about the raison d'etre, so what's the purpose of a glossary? I should also say that we have more than 100 terms. So to my knowledge, it's really the most comprehensive collection of, of terminology when it comes to our, our field of, of activity. We try to structure it into these um, categories that you see listed here on the, on the, on the right-hand side. And um, in order to basically be successful with the European data strategy, this is key. This is the ultimate key prerequisite. If we don't speak the same language, we will never be successful. And that is what the glossary is all about, to make sure that we use a consistent set of terms and um, basically minimize um, uh, semantic ambiguity in the way we, we, we talk with each other. Remember, there is no monolithic you know, group of people or monolithic um, agency, which basically implements the common data spaces on behalf of all of us. It's literally us who do it. And therefore we need to make sure that we speak the same language. Next slide, please. Right, the starter kit, as I mentioned, is something that brings you up to speed. If you are, let's say, new to the topic or have newly been assigned to, to the task to, to create a data space, um, it's always important to, to, to note that, let's say, the, the target groups are on the left-hand side, so it's basically data space designers, but also what well, producers of data and consumers, and also um, service providers in the data space field, in particular intermediary service providers. And um, on the right-hand side, you can basically see the, well, the, well, the table of contents, so to say. Um, the structure of the starter kit, and um, I think it's pretty straightforward and uh, relatively effective instrument to, to get you up to speed. Next slide, please. Yes, um, collection of standard was what I already mentioned. Um, I think I always <laughs> uh, stress this point. I think it was Tannenbaum, the computer scientist, um, researcher, who said it like back in the 90s, the good thing uh, when it comes to standards is that we have so many to choose from. <laughs> it's also true in our case. Um, but on the other hand, it's also natural because um, data spaces are, well, a design artifact, an information system class, or at least also an organizational artifact, which spans multiple domains. And therefore, it's necessary that we bring different, let's say, you know, schools or strands of standards together. And that is also one of our key um, ambitions to make sure that these can be used in a consistent way. Um, and of course, we will also want to look into, okay, where are white spots? And which kind of standardization um, processes should, can, and we have to, do we have to, um, to contribute to? Right, and perhaps next slide which brings me to the blueprint and in particular the building blocks. Um, I, I like also what you always said, Matthias, it, it brings people up to a, a higher flight level. Um, and uh, the general distinction between um, the different building blocks is um, into business and organizational ones and technical building blocks. Um, I think um, the technology is, so to say, the, the mandatory prerequisite or condition for success, but let's say the business view is the, the sufficient one. And, and therefore, my personal opinion is that we see a certain, let's say, 
move from discussions centered around technology. There are still open things to be discussed and still, of, of course, also much work to be done. But I, what I feel is, let's say, that the discussion moves towards more, okay, what's in for me? What's the business value? How do I come with, up with, uh, how do I come up with a sustainable operating model and these kind of things? And this is good news because it shows that, let's say, we, we make, we evolve in the, um, well, along maturity stages, so to say, in our endeavor. And I think this was the last slide of the intro slides, right? If you go one slide ahead, um, that basically con concludes my little overview about, let's say, how the different things are supposed to fit together. And I'm more than excited now to hand over to, to Bert, because now we are going into the details. Bert, please. Thank you very much, Boris. Um, Bert, uh, the floor is yours, and I believe you want to share the screen. Your mic is still closed, Bert. Thank you. I tried to share, but not yet. Oops. Oh, one minute. Share. Ah, I'm not able, Anna. So I. Sh okay, it's gonna be me. Then. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna sorry. Um, Zoom has not access to my PowerPoint slide. Um, thank you all. Um, and uh, Boris already gave a nice introduction to some of the topics. I will try to go a little bit deeper on in the next ten minutes. Um. Assets, glossary, and conceptual model. In the next slide, um, we start with that asset model. So this is an overview of all the work artifacts that the Data Space Support Center is working on at the moment, how they um, look like, how they're named, and how they interrelate. Glossary, conceptual model, the blueprint um, standards were all already mentioned, um, but they also have a, a, a relationship between them, and that is what this mod asset model illustrates. Um, the core of what we try to do is to support data space initiatives in their early creation phase, but also throughout uh, the life cycle of these data spaces and to create an environment that allows them to be successful and to be sustained and maintained in the long run. That's where also um, artifacts like the, uh, the maturity model come in and, and the information model. How do we even make it uh, known to people where these data spaces are? The data spaces radar is a, a way to do that. Um, and then the top part of the of this model is is where the core of this this webinar is about. So what is this blueprint about? What is it are its core ingredients and how do these uh, relate? It also helps to understand what the data space support center is not doing. We are not creating new standards. We are not implementing or creating code or templates or yeah, we are contributing to um, an environment where other parties, standardization organization or other competent organizations um, um, build these things and build these components. But the support center in the blueprint tries to harmonize how these pieces fit together into a logical structure, into building blocks that, that can be used together, how these um, elements interrelate and how to develop a consistent model in order to talk about them to interface between them and in order to bring them to use. So we hope that all of the assets that we work on um, ha each has their own place and all are uh, consistent with each other and contribute to what needs to get built and in, in a way that, that is sustainable and supports the very diverse data space initiatives that we try to support. Let's go a bit deeper in uh, into the conceptual model first or the glossary first, next slide. Um, yeah, the entry point, if you want to find uh, all the details uh, on the DSSC website, the DSSC offers button uh, below there is a, is a view graph or an overview of all these assets that I show in the previous slide, but in a hyperlink manner. So each artifact on that page is actually clickable. So from there you can uh, uh, drill into the conceptual model and the glossary where I'm going to talk about more uh, now. So all these materials that I discuss are available through the website. Next slide. The glossary already mentioned uh, by Boris, more than 100 terms. So where did this come from? 
Um, at the source, we talked a lot or we read a lot of the existing legislative frameworks, the, re the regulatory language that uh, that is in use. A lot of that language is actually quite recent and new, thanks to this uh, European Commission making a lot of these data-related acts lately. Uh, so all of these have already glossary and definitions in there, which we took um, as, an, as an important input. Each domain comes with some preferences and, uh, and some um, existing ontologies or, or, or name sets. The standards uh, come with our own definitions. So out of that, we try to converge and come to, to uh, um, uh, criteria-based definitions, which um, really help this community move forward. Um, with a core team of editors, the entire DSSC consortium and all of its stakeholders, we really have collected thousands of suggestions and comments on how things should be named. Um, you can imagine that that is not always an easy task and we cannot satisfy everyone, but at least the glossary that is there now, we believe is very supportive and instrumental to get us to the same page and have a consistent uh, uh, set of names, that set of definitions that really work across all these domains but also across the typical namespaces of technical engineering, software specialists, data specialists on the one hand, but also business stakeholders or legal stakeholders. It's quite a challenge to get all of these different stakeholders to use the same terms consistently. At least we've tried. There is a common base here now. And from there, we hope this can further be adopted and move to an adoption phase now. Um, and where needed to add some further clarifying texts of where and why there are differences for a specific function or a specific domain, which can be the case. And then we will just acknowledge that and document that. Next slide. The glossary does not stand on itself, but it serves a purpose about creating um, consistent concepts between what we are talking about. And, and Boris already showed this slide which is the, the highest level conceptual model. It's defining the data space itself and its essential ingredients. A data space is not only a technical infrastructure, it needs governance and it needs a number of stakeholders or participants that agree to collaborate with each other according to a set of rules. And that is what the data space governance authority defines. They describe these things in a governance framework um, they agree on the functionality that a data space should have. Um, and in the essence of the data space, uh, that is uh, a transaction of data that takes place in whatever form um, between stakeholders according to a definition of a data product in order to satisfy a data use case. So in, in, some, in one paragraph or two paragraphs of text, I try to summarize that definition and that highest level model. Actually, this model has been quite stable now over the past year, I would say, and is really starting to work and drives consistent usage of the terms amongst all ourselves and amongst all of our stakeholders. So I would say this model is quite stable. And now the challenge is, is how do we detail that further? So in the next slide is the first example of how we go from this top level to we drill down to more detailed concept. For example, here illustrated for the data product. How does that data product get used and how it is um, uh, constituated, um, how the product defines or instills rules that need to be followed and policies that can be um, get, that can be evaluated through a policy engine. So you see how starting from the data product concept, we may drill down in, in quite some additional concepts that are essential in order to create a common ground for, for uh, various of the building blocks that my colleagues will explain more later. Um, so the conceptual model is not a static thing. It is something that needs to be uh, detailed out depending on the context of purpose. Um, I can tell you if you explode all of the uh, concepts in here and all of the deaths, it becomes a quite extensive tree of knowledge a knowledge tree uh, that is driving us all. And also that from time to time still gives conflicts because terms are used in a certain con context differently than in an other context. And that is now, I think, the phase we are with uh, the version 1.0 and where we need to further mature in 1.5 and the 2.0 and the next releases of the blueprint, we will further evolve in driving consistency between how we conceptualize and how we name things. 
In the next slide, I believe we give a further example. Yes, um, this is a further drill down uh, or another uh, aspect view on the data product. And the data product is here articulated into a data product offering. And by talking with the various stakeholders, we, we felt the need to even split the data product concept in a business data product, something that product managers or data owners typically talk about. Um, and the more technical uh, data product description, which leads people to metadata uh, definitions and the way they describe uh, data products or data sets or data service offerings into a catalog. So you see that depending on the, the context, these concepts need to be further um, refined, detailed, and then still trying to keep them consistent. And uh, for example, here you see that a technical data product um, is an integral part of the business data product, but the business data product still adds additional um, data um, metadata elements like a commercial license or a price point or some more business uh, contexts uh, to that data product definition. And these type of discussions have uh, really led to a, a, a much better understanding of the different vantage points of, uh, of the stakeholders about a certain concept where initially we thought, well, a data product is pretty clear to everyone. Actually, it was not, and it needs a lot of further detailing uh, on how that concept is can be used by the different stakeholders. So this is an example of how the data product term evolves, but we could, uh, you will find, if you read the full blueprint, you will find much more uh, elaborations or detailing out how these concepts can be used. Next slide. Um, this is an illustration of another concept that got detailed out in the area of refining the, the various roles that parties have in a data space, and also uh, the growing importance of defining what the enabling functions are in order to, uh, to realize a data space, which could be technical or, or less technical enabling features, and also the place and the role of a data space intermediary. Um, a term that is actively used and developed as part of the Data Governance Act. But also we have seen and noticed that some stakeholders use the data space intermediary term even more broadly. And we need to further refine that concept, uh, like into personal data intermediaries, connection providing intermediaries, and so forth. So there is further detailing required if you go into more specific building blocks uh, around, around this term. So this is another example of how working on these terms and, and, and conceptual models allows us to, to give a consistent set of words and concepts for these communities to talk about. Um, and I have to admit, not all of these are totally mature yet. So here we really uh, continuously have an open ear to feedback from, uh, from, this, uh, from these stakeholder groups to further refine these concepts and how they relate and how they are defined. That brings me, I think, to my last slide. Next slide. I think this is your last slide, Bert. Okay. Uh, but <laughs> very good. Then I will wrap it up. Um, so I hope I've I've given you some further insight of how we are drilling down to the next level. Um, in an attempt to give us that common language between all of the stakeholders and to make sure that we can bridge across the domains where some domains sometimes have more specific language, and also across the different disciplines of legal, technical, and business in order to let uh, these people unite and, 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 and describe their governance frameworks and the data space concepts in a consistent manner. And now I hand it over to uh, my further my colleagues to detail and dive into the blueprint itself. Thank you very much, Bert. Uh, I think Matthias and Claire... Right. Yes. So hopefully, uh, can you still see uh, the screen? Yes. All right. And it works. Um, yes. Yeah, so uh, a big milestone for the DSSC to be able to uh, present uh, version 1.0 of the uh, blueprint. As Boris already mentioned, the result of a collaborative process between all kinds of organizations that uh, develop solutions for blueprints, for uh, data spaces, or that develop data spaces them, themselves. And there is a clear need uh, to uh, to have it. Um, and, and we identified actually three key reasons. First of all, to get to a higher flight level 
more quickly. There are a lot of things you have to think about when setting up a data space. Uh, and if everybody needs to reinvent the wheel again, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort. Uh, and if we really want to have this European data economy flying, then we need to um, uh, yeah, get going much more, much more quickly. And the blueprint enables you uh, to do that. Second reason is to be able to protect investments. Um, many, especially uh, enabling companies that want to develop uh, things like connectors and software or consultancy uh, for data spaces, they want to be able to do it across multiple domains. Um, and if you're investing in it, uh, you always want to make sure that your investment is also future proof, that you choose the right standards um, uh, so that it not only works today, but it is also working tomorrow. So protection of investment and making things future proof. And thirdly, uh, the role of federations. Organizations typically want to join multiple data space uh, initiatives because you're not only active in one sector, like say manufacturing, uh, but you also have uh, to deal with uh, uh, the Green Deal and with energy so you, or with mobility. So <clears throat> as a single company, you want to be able to join multiple data spaces, maybe in different sectors or in different regions because you're um, working internationally. Um, and then it becomes quite important to also achieve synergies between data spaces so that they can learn from each other and, and make it easy to, uh, to set up, but also to allow participants to easily join multiple data spaces. So faster, future-proof and federations. And in order to get there, the blueprint is a crucially important uh, element. Now, the blueprint itself is not new. Um, it builds on the knowledge that is generated in this uh, domain in the past uh, few years, although it, it got a lot of traction, in, let's say, in the last one, two years. Uh, there were already some pioneers working on this uh, for several uh, years. We've seen many data space initiatives uh, that already adopted uh, the results from the OpenDI project that uh, I think uh, about four years ago, um, published uh, this uh, document, the design principles for data spaces. And there for the first time, a set of building blocks was identified in uh, three technical pillars uh, and in one uh, governance uh, pillar. And that laid the foundation for our work because you can still trace a number of things that we published today in Blueprint version 1.0 back to uh, that development. So when we started uh, in uh, uh, end of 2022, beginning of 2023, uh, the Data Space Support Center, we've launched uh, the starter kit and we took that uh, uh, OpenDI result as an input uh, for that. And later last year, we published the initial draft version of the Blueprint version 0.5. And one of the things that changed uh, between OpenDI and the Blueprint that we presented then and that we present today is that, as Boris rightfully said, we put way more emphasis on the organizational and business side of things. Um, in, in OpenDI, it was, let's say, just the fourth column. Now it is really an integral part of, of our Blueprint. Uh, and today we are launching version 1.0 uh, of this blueprint. Now the blueprint itself, uh, it consists of uh, two parts. Uh, it consists of, first of all, of building blocks, and they are categorized in business and organizational and technical building blocks. Now on both sides, each building block identifies required capabilities for a data space. It doesn't specify yet how you should do it, but it is typically something that every data space needs and needs to think about. And then secondly, it introduces some core design decisions, not design decisions that we take, but design decisions that every data space initiative should take for each of those building blocks. But in order to get to that higher flight level, for many building blocks, we're able to provide common specifications and common standards or best practices so that you can really get to that higher flight level much more quickly. And finally, for each of the building blocks, we provide links to a lot of further reading material to we've identified best practices in our community of practice, and we have shared that in uh, the building block specifications. So with that, uh, maybe Claire, you want to take over for the business and organizational building yes. blocks. I think you have to Thank scroll you. with the wheel. Yeah, I'm going to get up further. 
Um, yes, I will explain you a bit more on um, the business uh, governance and legal building blocks. We have three pillars here. And if we compare that, for instance, to our previous blueprint version, um, we can actually say that we did not add new building blocks. We only changed some names for the governance building blocks. And for the rest, we extended the material inside the building blocks. I will... Um, dive a bit deeper into that together with you. So to start, for instance, with the four business building blocks, um, where we have a clear focus on uh, the value creation, especially with the business model, the value creation for, uh, first of all, the data space itself, but also the value creation for the participants, because that needs, of course, to be aligned with also the focus of um, the value creation of the data space. And we provided uh, a guidelines, templates, uh, further reading on the customer journey, on revenue and cost models that are very important for this. But we, for instance, also focus on uh, use case development. And um, an example of a use case is, for instance, in uh, for the uh, mobility data space in, uh, for instance, uh, the built environment. Uh, when monitoring the mobility infrastructure by collecting data about that, that could be an example of a use case here. And this building block is in particularly uh, supporting in exploring, developing, and also onboarding such use cases. Um, another building block that we have are uh, the data products that are already mentioned uh, by Bert. This specific, specific building block is focusing on the development of such um, a data product, for instance. A data set could be an example. And there are also templates to create this, um, as well as insights on governance and rules and principles to come to good data quality and security. Uh, this is an optional building block, so not every data space uh, will have this, that. And that's the same also for the data spaces uh, intermediary. That's an optional participant that provides enabling services for a data space. And um, when referring to enabling services, you can, for instance, think of identity management. Um, in this building block are four types of generic uh, models explained how a data space intermediary could look like and various guidelines are provided. Uh, this all brings us to uh, an overview of the various uh, value creation approaches related to the business model. So it's also uh, explained how these building blocks uh, contribute to the business model and relate to each other. Now I would like to move to the uh, governance. Oh, go back to the yeah, to the governance building blocks. These are the governance building blocks where we uh, focus on. Um, organizational form and governance authority. Um, and there it's important to realize that it's uh, dependent on the type of organizational form you choose that, that also impacts your further governance and also how your governance authority is organized. So uh, to give an example, if you, for instance, decide to uh, make it a non-for-profit organization, then you need also a general assembly and a management board. Um, besides that, uh, we have the building block of participation management, where it's focused on um, the, the governance of the participation, so to onboard and offboard the participants, uh, and their clear criteria uh, are provided for the admission and also for continued uh, participation, but also for the specification uh, of the roles. Uh, for that, a decision tree is uh, provided to support in the decision making uh, on these topics. Um, and we also have uh, the legal building blocks here. Um, so first of all, we have uh, the regulatory um, compliance, that's very important, and the contractual framework. Um, and for regulatory compliance, it's really to ensure uh, to adhere to the law. Um, and therefore, an overview of uh, the EU legislation is provided and also the roles and responsibilities uh, that relate to that. On contractual frameworks, um, the focus is on two parts. So on data space uh, agreements, uh, on the agreements among, among the participants, but also on agreements uh, on the data transactions. And also for this, uh, there is a tree provided here. You can see some examples of uh, relevant uh, legislation. Um, 
that uh, a data space and its participants need to take into account when uh, setting up a data space and working with it. Um, what's new to um, uh, these green building blocks? I would like to uh, summarize that uh, for you. Um, first of all, um, for the business side, uh, there is a visual overview of the business ingredients that are needed. Guidelines and templates are provided to take uh, business decisions and make it more practical and easy uh, to work on this. Um, and then for a governance, as I mentioned before, uh, we renamed two building blocks from uh, organizational governance into organizational form and governance authority to really um, make the focus more clear. Uh, and the data sharing governance uh, is now called participation management. Uh, as mentioned, there is a decision tree uh, provided uh, to organize and establish the data space and uh, guidelines on on and offboarding for participants. And uh, for the legal side, we um, have a checklist to become regulatory compliant and contractual framework agreements uh, to support in making agreements among participants and uh, on data transactions. That means that um, also with this version, we provided actually more details, more practical guidelines, and the idea is to further detail and, and make it more practical also towards the future. And now I would like to give uh, the floor to Matthijs. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Claire. Um, yeah, so moving on to the technical side of, uh, of things. So as you've seen on the business and organizational side, we, we clearly have way more building blocks than we had a couple of years ago. Uh, on the OpenDI side. If you compare that to the, uh, the technical building blocks, you will see lots of similarities. So you still see the three key pillars, one on data interoperability, one on data sovereignty and trust, and one on data value creation enablers. So the interoperability pillar, to start off with uh, that one, that's really about the common data models that you need in a data space. Uh, so semantics, um, you need to agree on that. And that's, in many cases, domain-specific, hence not covered as such in the uh, DSC blueprint. But we do try to provide you with ideas and guidelines as to how to set this up. How do you manage your data models in your community? And how do you also use them to configure the technical APIs that are needed to exchange data? Importantly, also, there is the notion of provenance and traceability. Because in many cases, there's a one-on-one -on -one translation from all the legal constructs that you have and technical requirements, for instance, to set up a notarization service in your data space for future traceability and so on. And that's also part of this pillar. The second pillar on data sovereignty and trust relates to um, the core, core notion of how to establish trust in a data space. And if you want to establish this, you need to know the other organization that you're dealing with. And typically that's not, that's an unknown organization because there is not a single system in a data space. And somebody comes to you and uh, wants to have access to your data or there's another business uh, scenario. So how do you then know, first of all, who this organization is and whether or not that organization actually complies with the rules and regulations of your data space? So that immediately links to the first two building blocks here. Identity and attestation management, the identity, as the name says, but also other attestations. For instance, I'm complying with certain legislation or certain security frameworks, or I'm a member of a data space. Secondly, there's the trust framework, because you always need one organization or multiple organizations that um, uh, can provide trust uh, in this data space, that can actually verify that indeed you are a member of, uh, of a data space. And finally, there's the notion of access and usage uh, policies. So uh, as a data provider, you want to specify under which conditions your data can be accessed, by whom. Uh, and there's a policy. And if on a technical level, somebody wants to uh, access that data, that policy needs to be checked and it also needs to be enforced. So that's all part of this second pillar on data sovereignty and trust. And finally, there's the data value creation enablers, uh, because, of course, it's not just about the technical interoperability and not just about uh, the semantics. We also need to do something with that with that data. 
And in many cases, that is a function that needs to happen within an individual participant of a data space. So it's not governed by what we do over here. But there are certain key functionalities that need to be supported there. So, for instance, you need to be able to specify what kind of data, what kind of services, and what kind of offerings uh, you have in the data space. Uh, and by the way, this is a technical notion. Uh, there are other scenarios possible as well. It's not just about trading data, of course, but in any case, you need to be able to publish not only who you are, but also what you have in, in the data space. Um, that needs to be discoverable. So maybe you need to have a catalog of that uh, information. Uh, so you, it also becomes findable. findable. And finally, there can be all kinds of value added services, for instance, provided uh, through this data, uh, data space intermediary that we talked about uh, before. Um, a service that provides uh, event brokerage uh, in a data space or supply chain resiliency services, uh, common services that, that made, are made available in a data space. And that's under the value added services bit. So now that you have an overview of the, of the building blocks, let's uh, dive a bit deeper into this. Um, the, the technical side of building of data spaces is maturing. We see a lot of technological convergence uh, here. And for us, very importantly, are the four foundational standards that are mentioned here in this slide. So it's on, it's on DIT for decentralized identifiers, because there are a lot of things that need to be identified. You can think of persons, you can think of assets, you can think of all kinds of things that play a role in that in that data space, and you need to be able to identify them. Then there is this notion of uh, trust and attestations. And for that, we have the W3C standard for uh, verifiable credentials and verifiable presentations. And that plays a crucially important role for the distributed credential validation, so that you can actually validate in a distributed way, this organization has this identity and is part of this data space. It is a foundational standard for setting up your trust framework. Then below that, you can see, I already talked about it, on access and usage policies. And also for that, there is a foundational standard, ODRL, to be able to specify this. And to the left, there's the DCAT standard, which is very well known in the uh, open data uh, field. And we also can deploy it in the data space world uh, to specify data services and offerings and to set up catalogs uh, of those. So these are important foundational standards uh, that we promote as a data space support center. Now, of course, that's not enough um, uh, because more is needed. How do these standards work uh, together? Um, and we try to specify that in, in the building blocks, but also we try to avoid reinventing the wheel there. Uh, the Data Space Support Center consists of uh, many organizations active in deploying those kinds of standards, um, providing standards frameworks how to, how to use them. Uh, we also have the wider uh, community of practice where a lot of organizations are working on uh, this. So what you will find in the blueprint is not only the notion of those foundational standards, but also how they can work uh, together. And for that description, we rely on the work of many of the organizations involved. So to mention one thing here in particular, that is the data space uh, protocol um, that really describes how, uh, for instance, these verifiable credentials, ODRL and DCAT can actually work together if two participants in the data space want to share data. So it's an important standard for us, and we refer to it uh, in uh, uh, the, the building blocks, and we also recommend its use uh, by data space initiatives. Still, and that's the top level that you can see here in this picture, there are other agreements that you need to make because they are data space specific. So also on the technical side, that there are certain design decisions that you have to uh, uh, take yourself. Uh, I already mentioned, for instance, the, the example of uh, semantics that is domain specific. So in your data space specific, rule book or blueprint or agreement or whatever term uh, you define there. By the way, looking at you here, Bert, for the glossary, maybe we need to find a specific term uh, for, uh, for this. Um, but anyhow, there will be data space specific uh, elements, but because we have this common basis, we allow you to focus on those things and at the same time also facilitate interoperability between data spaces.
So also to give a little overview on what is new in version 1.0 compared to uh, the draft version that we released early on, we have more emphasis now in the first pillar on the use of a vocabulary hub to uh, manage uh, semantic models in your community uh, process. Uh, and we, for the first time, introduced some, some approaches for provenance and traceability. It was rather empty in version 0.5. We've now uh, provided some more content uh, here, and we hope to add further content in next versions of the blueprint. I already talked about what we did in uh, the, the second pillar, so the use of verifiable credentials, the role of trust frameworks, and uh, access and usage uh, policies. Um, and finally, in uh, the third pillar, uh, we explained the use of DCAT. Um, and, and I think that's actually an important change to highlight. Uh, if you looked at previous versions of uh, our blueprint, and also uh, if you looked at um, the OpenDI framework on data value creation, it was just about the marketplace. And we said, well, that is a business model, and, and therefore that could be a technical service that you need. But similarly, if you have a different business model that is not based on the actual trading of data, uh, but just the use of data, then probably you don't need a marketplace, but you need other kinds of value-added services. So that's why we've replaced the marketplace building block with a building block titled value-added services, and the marketplace is only one of the possible value-added services as we see. Now, of course, um, I've talked a lot about uh, standards and specifications, uh, but at the end of the day, you also need to implement uh, things. And then a building block does not translate one-on-one -on -one into a software component. So in version 1.0, we have created a functional overview of software components, now for the first time. Um, and there we distinguish between software that you need uh, on a participant level. So in some instances, this is called a connector, but some other approaches maybe as well, but on a participant level, call it here a participant agent, you need to have a piece of software uh, that implements essentially two things. Your control plane that handles all the things uh, around verifiable credentials, your access and usage policies, the, public, the publishing of your data uh, sources. So that's the whole control plane uh, part. And on the other hand, uh, also the data plane. So this is where the actual data exchange take place. And those two, they need to work hand in hand because you only want the data exchange to take place if uh, certain checks uh, have, been, have been made. And this is all in the uh, participant agent. Then on the other hand, uh, you can see some shared services. So your data space probably needs to have some sort of participants registry. Uh, probably you need some sort of catalog where you can find all the data entries that are available in the data space. There's the vocabulary hub. Maybe you need the notarization service or the other value added services that we talked about. So that also constitutes a category of software components. So this is a list. If you go to the blueprint, you will also find a picture of this. And we hope to be able to work with the community uh, to also identify key examples of those um, uh, categories of components. Um, and we do that with the, the parties in the data space support center, the wider community. Uh, and this is also something where we seek alignment with uh, the simple initiative that aims to build a distribution of uh, open source software components also for data spaces. Now with that, I can even fill the full uh, one and a half hour with all of this. Uh, I can also imagine that it is now difficult for you to grasp, uh, uh, okay, but where, where should I start? Which building block? There are nine technical building blocks, even more business and organizational building blocks. So maybe uh, this is uh, something, uh, Claire, where you can uh, yeah. take us through how to exactly. navigate uh, the blueprint. Exactly. And uh, compare it also a bit with when building a house. Um, well, we explain today all the ingredients, the various building blocks, but how to bring them together and where where exactly to start. Um, so first of all, um, well, the, exactly what I said, where to begin. And um, it's often also a collaborative process. So you really need to do this together with the participants in the data space. Um, and not every building block is also needed at uh, the same time um, and thereby important to build on the results that we have here. 
Um, so we developed the co-creation uh, method. And the co-creation method is really an, an approach to guide the data space initiatives on uh, where to start, how to set up a data space, and also um, yeah, how to run it when it's operational. Um, and therefore, along the various uh, steps of the, the data space uh, life cycle, so to say, from the exploratory stage through the operations, um, various processes have been developed. So to align the stakeholders in this collaborative process on the scope of the data space, uh, to develop the use cases, as mentioned before, and uh, focus on the functional requirements there, but also how to organize this in an organizational way, which organizational form to choose, um, and next to that, what are the functional uh, elements that are needed uh, to design uh, the data space and how to establish the agreements and uh, yeah, become legally compliant. Uh, based on those processes, we linked the various uh, building blocks uh, to them, so both business and organizational ones, as well as the technical ones, to really support here in, in guiding where to start and when which steps to be taken. Um, in the next uh, figure, uh, in the previous figure, you saw the, the blue and the, the green building blocks. Here you see really a listing of these building blocks uh, exactly for each of the processes that I was uh, just mentioning. Um, so it starts with the stakeholders, then later on move from the, from the business and organizational side to the technical side. Later in updates, you will see that some um, building blocks uh, on the technical side might also start uh, earlier, but that's uh, uh, for the future. Um, but this is all to really support in, uh, yeah, prioritizing and, and really going and navigate uh, together towards uh, the data space and becoming operational. Um, well, this is so far our uh, a presentation on the blueprint and the co-creation uh, method. Um, if you want to connect, use and contribute uh, to this work, um, you can use the blueprint that's presented uh, online uh, and thereby um, enhance and develop your rulebook for your own data space um, you can comply or comply or explain, you can contribute. Um, and as mentioned in the beginning, um, we provided uh, there the various details and you can also find it here of our website uh, to come in contact. Uh, yeah, people please. cannot only do that, people should do it. And we, we sure. truly welcome uh, exactly. your input on this, yeah. uh, both your experiences, how you can use it, but also if you have uh, further additions and suggestions uh, for the various building blocks that we uh, that we have. Exactly, because it's important to uh, co-create this uh, together. That's it. I would like to give uh, the word back to Anna. Hi, Claire. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias, for the great presentation. We have quite a few questions from the audience. If I would like to ask you a little favor to go to the very the next slide, which is a very uh, Perfect. So we can now officially open our Q&A session. Uh, we have many questions that already has been, have been dealt with uh, by an answer by Gianfranco, but I also would like to hear your opinion as well, because some are really interesting questions, which I have the feeling will really um, give a new meaning uh, to our work around the blueprint. So let me pick one. Uh, I see Sotiris wrote, how will the DSSC blueprint facilitate cross-sector data sharing, particularly with non-technical stake stakeholders involved? Uh, who would like to take this question? Yes, uh, I can pick that up. Okay. Uh, so um, uh, first of all, um, uh, we have, of course, in the thematic group and the expert group, various um, uh, different um, uh, data spaces and CSAs uh, involved to really also ensure uh, this cooperation and and uh, really to focus also together on the on the, the federation part there, uh, also especially for uh, the non technical uh, building blocks and all where also towards the future and towards our next uh, blueprint. The plan is also to focus more and more uh, uh, on that. Uh, so in the upcoming period, you will also see more here um, and uh, yeah. Please indicate if you also have, for instance, best practices in your work. Uh, yeah, let us know, and we are happy to cooperate, especially on these elements. Yes, indeed, and, and maybe to add to that, um, of course, if you want to collaborate between 
uh, certain domains, uh, then it is inevitable that there are going to be differences because every domain and every country is, uh, is, is different. But it becomes easier if you've used the same framework to set up your data space initiative because then you can actually focus just on those differences um, instead of uh, yeah all kinds of other things that that could have otherwise played uh, played a role there. Yeah. Thank you very much to both. Uh, I think I will deal with another challenging follow up, a nice follow up question from Sotiri still, which would deal deals a bit more with standards uh, and says um, in terms of international standardization efforts. How does the DSSC ensure alignment with global data governance policies? That's ah, big... excellent. <laughs> yeah. excellent, uh, excellent question. So, um, actually, there, there are there are two elements uh, to this. So, first of all, uh, data governance policies differ from country to country. Uh, I think, uh, as Europe with the GDPR, for instance, we really set uh, set the tone uh, there, but uh, it is different in different regimes. So. Um, at the end of the day, with the uh, the proposal that we have for using ODRL, for instance, it is possible to create any kind of data governance policy. It becomes explicit. Uh, and then you can also uh, assess uh, how to bridge it between different domains. So that's one element uh, to it. We do not prescribe it, uh, but we do enable it. Um, uh, and, and of course... Uh, and we've seen that happening with, with GDPR. If there are best practices, for instance, coming from Europe, then uh, maybe the world can take over. But on the technical side, we can support any data governance policy that is uh, that is out there. I think the same also goes for identity and trust. Um, uh, with the introduction of uh, EIDAS 2.0, um, uh, there are new functionalities available, and especially a new legal framework available for handling digital identities. Uh, so we support that with uh, the, the the way we describe uh, the, the trust framework and we also address it in the legal uh, building blocks uh, but we also of course have to recognize that that companies also need to be able to operate in the us or in asia where this legal regime does not apply um, so there also on the technical side we do support the use of other trust frameworks uh, too um, so hopefully that addresses a little bit uh, the the question. Um, although if if uh, Sotiris is, uh, is pointing at a very specific initiative or specific things where he thinks when reading the blueprint we should take that into account, also happy to learn that of course. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Matthias. Uh, we have another question from our Lee which asks, when can we expect recommendation for compatible technology stacks, uh, like publishers and providers, as mentioned in the starter kit? Um, I think, but maybe Aurelie can uh, clarify that. Uh, um, uh, is she pointing here at uh, the, the software frameworks? I assume so, huh? No, I don't have, a, um, I don't okay. have any uh, following. Okay. Uh, so what... Um, she is invited, of course, really uh, to to. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe if she, she can address it. Sure. But um, um, the thing is, we we will not uh, let's say uh, provide a single recommendation saying uh, you shall use this particular piece of software. That is, of course, not the role uh, that we have uh, as a data space uh, support center. Based on the blueprint, we do expect later in the year, uh, and this is also what we've announced in our symposium in Darmstadt, uh, to provide a toolkit uh, that is a place for possible software technologies to uh, to land. Um, and we can also link uh, data space initiatives uh, to other initiatives that are out there that actually develop uh, software. Uh, so we're also uh, yeah, very interested to learn what the simple initiative uh, will bring, but we also know that there are various open source uh, initiatives and we can provide pointers uh, to, uh, uh, to those, but we're not going to provide software on our own. Nevertheless, by having common specifications and by pointing uh, uh, to, to them, we do hope that we can, from the role that we have, facilitate this uh, technology convergence so that at the end of the day, uh, even though that there might be different uh, technology stacks, that they do become interoperable because that's what we all uh, strive uh, for. 
So hopefully this uh, this this helps to address this. But uh, Aurélie, if you have uh, specific things in mind uh, here, uh, please uh, reach out to us and 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 we get in touch with you on this. Because we're also happy to learn from you. Thank you very much, Matthias. I will let you breathe a little bit with all, <laughs> with all this. Um, so now I'll read another question from the audience uh, from Malte, who asks, will there be a possibility to be DSSC certified for building blueprint conform building blocks? And how can we as an organization be proactive about contributing to this? Oh, that's an excellent uh, question, but maybe this is something, uh, I'm not sure if Boris is still uh, with us. Uh, he or, unfortunately or had to. He uh, just left with uh, Gianfranco, but we will. Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh. Like, do you want to say something about this bet? Otherwise, I can also take it. But yes, there are no, there is no intention to make a DSC yeah. certification at all, uh, because there are sufficient other certifying organizations available. So if it need to get to that point, then uh, we should refer to other uh, initiatives to take up uh, that need. Um, yeah, so th in that sense, the best way for uh, partners to prepare is to uh, really study the blueprint and its guidance, the translation into components and into the toolkit, uh, and, and, and then learn from there, uh, because we really try to converge um, the concepts at a somewhat higher level, not at the detailed um, certification uh, level. Okay, thank you very much, Bert. Uh, thank you, Matthias, again. Um, I have an another uh, question with, from Stefan uh, from the audience who asks, how does the DSSC blueprint fits to the architecture of GAIAX and IDSA? <sighs> Which is... Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, well, that's... Uh, um, uh, it, it fits to those architectures but it also fits to architectures from, for instance, Fireware and architectures from MyData and architectures from iShare and several initiatives that are out there that, that actually provide um, detailed frameworks uh, for, for data exchange. And they each have their own focus. Uh, MyData has its focus on uh, the, the personal data uh, element um, uh, and, and it's more on, on the, the, the governance side, maybe slightly less on the technical side. Other frameworks are slightly more focused on the technical side. Um, so, so each has its own focus. And what we try to do in the blueprint is to learn from them, uh, take the key concepts uh, um, and uh, put them in, in, in the blueprint. And in that sense, we, we are interoperable with them or so. We, we provide a common foundation uh, there. Um, uh, but they themselves can then now take this and move further. So if I take as one example Gaia-X, um, there is a trust framework in, in the blueprint, and there's a building block called trust framework. Uh, Gaia-X is implementing a trust framework. Uh, so this is a bit how, how uh, we see the relationship uh, between, uh, between the two. Uh, but next to Gaia-X, others can also, of course, in, implement a, a trust framework. Okay, thank you very much. Now, this is, uh, fortunately for you, Matthias, this is a Dutch-specific question, so I might <laughs> need to, we have, uh, well, we need to call your expertise again. Uh, uh, Emmanuel Mondon from the audience is asking, related to the business building blocks, use case development of the DSSC blueprint, is there any link with the Dutch uh, data sharing coalition? Yes, uh, because uh, we, of course, build further on existing materials, and uh, this is also a, a part of that work, so uh, definitely, uh, yes. And uh, by the way, the, the Data Share Coalition, I think, is also part of uh, our uh, strategic stakeholder forum. Exactly, yeah. Uh, so this is one of the national initiatives that the DSC works with, yes. Yeah, so in terms of stakeholders, as well as in terms of content, yeah, um, yeah we are aligned and cooperate. Thank you very much uh, to both. Uh, I think Lina here has a follow-up question from the previous ones that were already answered, which is, is there or will there be some kind of comparison of different available standards within the company? Uh, 
Uh, well, the, so so not as such in the blueprint. So we don't really compare. Let's say, well, you have standard A and B. Maybe in some circumstances we do that over there. But what we actually did do, uh, and that is the collection of standards that uh, Boris presented uh, earlier on, is we did make actually a wide inventory. We just asked data space initiatives, what kind of standards do you see? Do you use? Uh, uh, do you consider potentially for, for adopting. Um, and what we did try to do without giving, let's say, a content-wise assessment of those, we did try to position them a little bit. So are they used in multiple data spaces? Are they domain-specific or domain-agnostic? Uh, and so on. So this is the list uh, that, um, uh, uh, that Boris talked about, and I think it is also published and, and, and available. Um, nevertheless, if somebody has a specific question on a specific standard, we also have the uh, the support function in the DSSC. And although we might not be able to one-on-one -on -one address each individual request, we do try to process this uh, the best we can. So if you have a specific question on that, also feel free to, to reach out and then we can see whether we can uh, help you with that or whether we can forward you to uh, maybe a domain-specific initiative uh, or uh, one of the initiatives that are part of the DSSC to help you further uh, to address the question. Thank you, Matthijs. Uh, I will let you breathe a second uh, because I will answer from one question to the audience, which is, do you plan to record uh, jar Georg is asking, do you plan to record webinars for every group of building blocks? It could be helpful for, for dissemination for the content. Uh, I can say on the DSCCN that we uh, haven't planned for it yet, but we will certainly take note of this request because we are um, always listening to our community to try to find the best way how to disseminate the, the, the content of the blueprint so we will uh, we will note down this request and we will try to follow up with something that satisfies our community. Uh, and on that note, I have another big uh, question from Stefan, which asks, um, and how does simple fit in all of this? Uh, well, <laughs> big question. I think that's a simple question uh, then. <laughs> yeah, so... <clears throat> um, so first of all, keep in mind that the Data, Data Space Support Center and uh, the SIMPLE project, because we are both projects, um, have a different statute. Uh, so the Data Space Support Center is a coordination and support action and addressing the needs of uh, the common European data space initiatives that were set up in all various domains. Um, and we're a project under the Digital Europe program, bringing together uh, all the organizations that are part of the DSSC. Simple project is a procurement action. So uh, the commission has said, we are going to buy software, in short, uh, 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 middleware uh, for facilitating data spaces. And by the way, we are going to start with uh, uh, a number of public sector data spaces that require immediate support, but we want to make the required software publicly available um, in open source, because we know that uh, uh, the, the requirements for this software are, are way much wider. So as of now, we, we try to seek uh, alignment there with, uh, with Simple. Uh, I presented you this, uh, this, this functional overview of categories of software components. But as of now, it is not published which kind of software uh, the simple uh, initiative will uh, will deliver. Uh, but we do try to align uh, there, and we also offer the blueprint and the, the wider analysis that we uh, that we did uh, to the simple consortium on one hand, uh, which is contracted to build software, and also to the European Commission uh, to serve as input for what they are going to ask to the consortium. So this is a little bit uh, the, the dynamic. This is ongoing, um, uh, but we do have the ambition uh, for the next version of the blueprint, uh, which is due uh, in the autumn, uh, to have that clearly aligned with Simple, because Simple uh, will also be more mature uh, by, uh, by, by autumn. Um, and in the uh, period to come, we will seek that uh, detailed uh, alignment with, uh, with them. Uh, because we both feel, and also the commission feels, that... Uh, 
this should be really uh, uh, yeah, smooth sailing and, and an aligned effort to support uh, data spaces. So that's what I can say about this right now. Thank you very much, Matthijs. Uh, there is um, one of the last questions from the audience that we will read today, which is from Michael or Michael Kaluza, who's asking, uh, is there any linkage to idea TA, which I suppose, yeah, uh, when it comes uh, to semantic models support by the SSE? Uh, that's, uh, Good question. I, I just came back actually from uh, the Hanover Fair uh, earlier this week. I know some of you might still be uh, there or might have visited uh, today. Uh, the biggest industrial fair of uh, at least of Europe and, and also one of the largest in the, in the world. And I also recognize the big presence of the IDTA, which uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it stands for the Industrial Digital Twin uh, Association. Um, uh, and, and they develop, for instance, models, what they call the asset administration shell. So let's say the digital twin of all kinds of uh, industrial assets, machines, uh, equipment, and so on. Um, so I think this is a good example of what we actually do as a DSCC and what we don't do. So what we do recommend, if somebody comes to us and says, hey, we want to uh, build a data space for, let's say, manufacturing, then in this journey, uh, Claire, that you uh, presented, there will be a step that you have to think about data models. And then one of the questions is, are there already data models available in your domain and sector? If yes, check whether you can use them. So in the case of manufacturing, this would then, for instance, point you to the Industrial Digital Twin Association, because I know that the IDTA is providing a large collection of semantic models for industry and manufacturing. Um, but of course, as a DSC, we are not going to uh, redo those models because that's something that the IDTA is already doing and which by the way is also domain specific because it relates to you know, industry and, and manufacturing. Uh, another example would be the Smart Data Models Initiative, uh, which is used a lot in mostly smart cities and in some other domains. Uh, where you have uh, data models for uh, smart parking lots and, and all kinds of other smart stuff that you have in a, in a smart uh, city. Also there, we will not redo that work. We will not include that as such in the blueprint because it is domain specific. But by, by uh, providing these uh, design choices and by providing references, references, we do hope to stimulate that organizations start to use those common data models uh, instead of reinventing the wheel uh, time and time again. Thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, we have a question from the audience, which was partially answered by uh, by Bert. Uh, questions from Lena. Um, maybe a picture would be nice to see how the different project initiatives and standards are connected and linked to each other. Can you provide something like this? Uh, Lena, uh, dear Lena, as Bert mentioned, the picture is already in our um, in our in, in our advertising or marketing materials. It was first created for the Data Space Symposium, but we can we will be very happy to share it again with you. So if you want to uh, reach out to us, send us a private message. We will we will send it to you. So in, in order, maybe we hope that it can give a clearer overview of all that the SSE does. Yeah. And so, I think that is there's no more questions thank you very much to Matthias and Claire and all the other speakers Bert uh, as well uh, unfortunately Boris and uh, Boris had to leave to another meeting but thanks thanks again to him and we 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 I would like to remind you I would like to remind you again uh, you see a QR code here in the in the slide uh, in order to stay up to date to everything that we, that we do, uh, all the events, all the deliverables, all the technical updates, uh, please subscribe to the DSC newsletter. It's growing in a big community and uh, it, that's the best and fastest way to stay always up to date with everything that we do.
And on this note, since I will, there is no other questions, I would like to thank our speakers again, all the attendees who stayed with us to the very end. And we, we are looking forward to see you at the next uh, DSS Insights Series webinar. Thank you very much.